Classes in Wargame Design, a series of lectures based on George Philly's book, Designing Board Wargames, Introduction, to be available from Smashwords.com and Amazon Kindle. And today, Lecture 6, Unit Counters, Movement Rules for the Game Stalingrad. Good afternoon. What I'm going to do today is to discuss in particular the Stalingrad movement rules and we will perhaps move towards the Stalingrad combat rules. Stalingrad is sort of an archetypical board war game. Some people are very fond of it, some people think it's oversimplified, uh, some people don't like the level of historical accuracy. However, it's sort of an archetype and you can do all sorts of variations and changes and we'll be looking at a few games that deliver on a few of these. Um, last time we discussed terrain and I made the point there were sort of three types of terrain in the game. There were terrain features that basically occupy entire squares. For example, here we have a square that's full of mountains. It's a mountain square. It's rough terrain. We also had terrain features that run through the squares. And here is a rail line that runs through the square. <clears throat> we do not have in Stalingrad in large quantities, but we do in some other games, terrain features that run along the edges of squares. <coughs> For example, referring back to Panzer Blitz, which is sort of an archetypical small-scale tactical game, uh, we have woods edges, we have rough terrain edges, and the function of these things that run along square edges is to block lines of sight. Um, if we talk about a Normandy game, we might say we have bocage, rough terrain, which is really linear feature, runs along the hex edge. So let us now advance. And having said we have squares, we have terrain, We'll start with movement. The core notion, distinguishing feature of board war games relative to classic folk games like, oh, chess, is that in most folk games you have a restricted resource, namely how many moves you can make in a turn. So if you're playing chess or checkers, you get to move one unit. In checkers, the unit may get to do several things as it moves. In chess, the unit moves, that's it. In go, you don't even get to move the unit. You just drop it down on the intersection between two squares, and you are done. In a typical board war game, you get to move more or less all of your units. Now, that's not always necessarily true. For example, there are games in which uh, one side or the other has command restrictions on how many moves you can make. Um, <clears throat> for example, we have a board war game on a Napoleonic battle. The, um, Napo the Russian army fighting Napoleon has had a vigorous party the night before, at least this is what some historians claim, and it starts getting off the ground rather slowly, and the commanding general sort of has to wander around giving people a swift kick in the behind to get them to move their army corps a bit. So we have these um, possibilities for restricted movement, but the general statement in a board war game is that you get to move more or less everything. Then if we're talking about most classic folk games, you make a move and you will get typically one capture. Now the capture may be several pieces, as in checkers, or it may be a formation of pieces, as in go, but you make a move, something happens, and that's it. The board get historical games are supposed to be simulating what happens during a time period, and during a time period, you typically get to move more or less all of your units, and they all get to make the attacks they choose to make. Now, there are bunches of ways you can make this more complicated. 
For example, if you say we have, we're on a tactical scale so we can see the tanks and the artillery pieces and the squads or platoons of men, and maybe we will duplicate fire combat, which is really simultaneous, by having the players take turns designating single attacks. And because you take turns and there are a lot of things happening, it's almost the same as simultaneous movement, but you don't have any paper, you don't have nearly the record keeping problems. So that's roughly the core difference between board war games. So how do you move? So let us consider Stalingrad. And the map board, the Stalingrad map board, is broken up into hexagons. That's a grid pattern that was used, oh, by the Rand Corporation in the mid-50s. It was not used by Roberts and on one hand, you might say he may or may not have known about it. And on the other hand, um, Roberts had the practical consideration. He actually had to have a draftsman do the map. There is an obvious drafting error on one of the maps. There's this road that just chugs off an extra square or two and stops and seems to be floating out by itself for no rational reason. Um, however, um, hexagons are much harder to do than squares if you're a draftsman. Uh, so hexagons are more recent. But here we are, and the statement is, we have a unit counter here, and the unit counter may move in any direction or combination of directions. So there is a legal move. And as you move, you expend movement points. Uh, Stalingrad keeps this rather simple. Each move expends a simple movement point. And you can only expend movement points up to however many movement points the unit has. Uh, the Stalingrad, the archetypical Stalingrad unit counters box oops, two, three, six. The six is the movement factor. It's how many movement points the unit has. Most of the units are fours. Some of them are sixes. And in Stalingrad, that's it. You could do something much more complicated. You could have an army, if, especially if you're creating, as Charles Roberts did, a hypothetical continent and hypothetical armies. You could have units with all sorts of different movement factors. But Stalingrad keeps this fairly simple. And all of the units, um, the statement is, you move any or all of your units in whatever pattern you want. And as you move, you expend movement points. They, the unit movement points can't be shared between units. That is, each unit has its own ability to move. The movement points can't be stored from turn to turn. The units only move a certain distance each month, and that's it. Um, you, you recognize this is rather different than, say, chess, where um, a pawn moves one or two, no more or no less, and a, a knight can only go to eight neighboring squares. The bishops can move all sorts of different distances, but only in straight lines. This is much more um, straightforward uh, in terms of this looks more like reality. That is, the units can move in different paths as they see fit. Um, having said that, and having waved a 2, 3, 6, maybe I should say what the unit counters look like, the things that we are going to be moving. And so I will draw one big unit counter. And it has at the bottom, and this is sort of the key feature that lets you know that you have a board war game, your unit counters are sitting there, and the unit counters have on them numbers that convey quantitative information. Now, the historical unit counters were little square chits. However, you could imagine wooden blocks and one side faces you, and you can see the numbers, and the other side faces the opponent. He can't see the numbers. This is a, what is called a block game. Um, they're a little elaborate to build. Um, the blocks get expensive and heavy, so a block game with a thousand unit counters would need a wheelbarrow. 
uh, which I do not recommend turning in. So they're unit numbers. And then if you look carefully, you will find there is traditionally an object sitting here. And the object will have a symbol in it. And the object will have, this is not an actual Stalingrad counter, some marks up on top. And then you will see over here, for example, a number. And what you are looking at in the traditional form, this number is an attack strength. This number is a defense strength. And this number is the movement factor. Now, there's no requirement when you do a game that you put the numbers on the counter in the same order, assuming you have the same numbers. However, it is much less work for people to learn the game if they don't have to figure out that this is the movement factor, this is the defense factor, and this is the attack factor. And as a practical matter, if you reuse terminology and such not from other games, you will be better off. Um, it is just as if we had a computer board game, and it is the old-fashioned keystroke control as to which way we're going, well, the keystroke could indicate the direction the character is going to move, or it could indicate the direction the map is going to move under the character since the character stays centered. Now, either of these is perfectly legitimate, but if you have to switch between games, it rapidly becomes annoying, doesn't it? And so, you sensibly reuse things that have been used before. This object is what is called a NATO unit symbol. And it really has two parts. And the part down below tells you the type of unit you have. And the markings up here tell you the size. And if you are doing a game on many periods, for example, suppose you're doing a Napoleonic game. You would have artillery, you would have cavalry, you would have infantry. You actually do have engineers for bridging. Uh, you might have headquarters units. However, each of these types of units is very different in what it can do in combat, how it moves, and so forth. You might have different rules for each of these types. For example, it might be that only artillery can bombard target several squares away, and therefore you want some symbol to tell you what sort of units you have. And the, what is in this block does that. The items on top, the little marks on top, indicate size, that is how big the unit is. Now, in Stalingrad, all units are core. And because all units are army core, well, actually, for the Russian army, they're what the Russians called armies, but they're basically core size units. You have these little three X's up here. They're absolutely the same for every unit, so they're chrome. They don't affect the play of the game. Well, that's a very important word, which I'm going to keep reusing. Chrome. Chrome is something that makes the game shiny and pretty. But it doesn't really add anything to the play of the game. It's like an automobile. If you go back to a 50s automo 1950s automobile in the sunlight, it tended to glare a great deal because there was all of this metallic chrome work, which indicated how fancy the body was, at least until it rusted out after two years. Um, under modern, con the other, however, the chrome may or may not affect the play of the game at all. In Stalingrad. I go over here. In Stalingrad, we have infantry, we have cavalry, we have armor. That's supposed to be an oval. It looks like a tank tread. This is a slash. I suppose the slash looks like a cavalry saber, a weapon not in use in the period. And the X looks like, um, well, at one time it looked like the webbing that a soldier would have to support the pack on his back. And so this is infantry, this is armor, 
this is cavalry. If you look carefully through the rules, you discover that while the symbols are there, the type of unit has no direct effect on how the unit functions in combat. The closest it comes to having an effect is that armor and cavalry units all have six movement points and infantry has four. Now you could imagine a designer who saw armor and cavalry is six, infantry is four, so I don't have to print it on the unit counter, I can just put it into the rules book. But it's much easier for the player to read if it's right there in front of them, the number, and so that's how it's done. This thing, we'll come back to these in a second, is the unit identification number, the unit ID. Um, units are numbered. And so, and if you see someone talking, reporting on warfare, whatever country we invaded this week, um, you will discover that they will refer to the 82nd Armored Division, the 1st Infantry Division, and that's because you have units and the units are given numbers so they can be told apart and can send orders to specific units. In some foreign countries, the units are not given numbers, they're named. And so we have the um, uh, horse English Horse Guards, which is actually their general headquarters. We have the um, Grenadiers, we have this, we have that, and we have units with names. And the names have to get abbreviated in here somehow so people can tell what the um, unit is. So, attack factor, defense factor, movement factor, unit type, which doesn't do anything, size that doesn't do anything, unit ID. Oh, there's one other thing. The game is between two countries. It's between the Russians who are defending the country and the Germans who are invading it, and then the Germans have several allies who get dragged in at various points. And it is convenient to be able to tell the units apart. Now, people have tried this in various ways, but the basic scheme that works, which I can't draw on the board, is color. That is, we have unit counters, we make them of somewhat of distinct colors, and the players can tell, I have the pink units, I have the blue units, whatever, and we can tell things apart. So having said color, let me put in a few comments on color at some point. Uh, there was at one time a fad for making unit counters, the colors of the countries are uniforms. Now, if you are in period, Napoleonic period, the problem was that every regiment had its own color. And if you make every regiment on each side the color of that regiment, you have, well, there was one game I reviewed as Napoleon's Chromatic Fantasy. Uh, every color under the sun. And the designer hadn't even showed up with the uh, unit whose nickname was the Canaries because the uniform was bright yellow with red piping. Um, the difficulty with this is that you now have this hodgepodge of colors and you're trying to sort out whose is which, and this gets difficult. So the, the more effective scheme is to stay with fairly plain colors the traditional are, in fact, pink and blue to um, distinguish one side from the other. If you go to dark gray, dark green, you come to a problem which I am now going to introduce, which is politely known as hypochromatism. The fancier name is color blindness, which is somewhat more complicated than some people thought at one time. And the issue is that everyone cannot easily distinguish different colors. Um, this is the largest single is um, red-green color blindness. We don't tell them apart. This is mostly a problem with male players, but most players are male, because the gene in question is carried on the X chromosome. If you have a gene for the color sensitivity, you're fine. Of course, women have two X chromosomes. Guys don't. And therefore, color blindness is mostly but not completely a male problem. Uh, there are three dyes in the human eyes. 
they're sort of like the three dyes you have in a uh, television monitor, red, green, blue. However, the dyes absorb color of a wide range, light of a wide range of colors, while the uh, phosphors, or LEDs in some modern devices, give off monochromatic light of one color or another. And as a result, um, the ish first issue is that um, if you're missing one of the dyes, you can't distinguish colors in that region. You can still see it because you have a separate set of cells that detect brightness or dimness, but you can't tell what the colors are. Or more important, some of your players can't. There are also people who have reduced color sensitivity, um, which simply makes life annoying but not impossible. Uh, at the other end, um, Human beings actually have two distinct red dyes. And at least if you're a woman, you can inherit both of them. And I gather, though there seems to be some controversy about this, there are people who have this condition who distinguish co uh, colors. Those two are obviously different. And to the rest of us, they look exactly the same. Um, so you sort of want to keep things fairly simple and matters will work. The traditional colored Xerox paper, blue, pink, yellow, green, are actually nice choices. The second point is here we have a surface. And what a chalkboard does is exactly the opposite of what is good. That is, you're looking at light lines on a dark background. A printed book has dark lines on a light background. Now, obviously, you could do it either way, um, you, though, if you think about things. But it turns out that the human eye is optimized for pr picking out dark lines on a light background. The ideal background is monochromatic, because that, if it's monochromatic, you do not have problems with aberration. That is, the eye doesn't focus perfectly all colors of light at the same time. So there is a little fuzzing that you get if you're looking at a mixed color object that you don't get if you're looking at an LED, which is monochromatic. Um, the ideal background turns out to be light green. This was discovered, demonstrated by Victorian physicists who were trying to build the perfect galvanometer, the perfect device using Victorian technology for measuring voltages. And so they did all sorts of experiments, and this is what comes out. You will get people who design games and will give you silver or white ink on a black background. <coughs> That's very hard to read because the eye views it as fuzzy. The eye views, if this were a light background and a dark number, you'd see a one. Because you have a light background and a dark number, the eye actually is processing it as something a little closer to this. Not exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a somewhat complicated issue down to a few sentences. And the net result is that reading light objects on a dark background does not work as well. This is why these book readers that people are now selling for people who don't expect a computer to be a big box and a computer screen on their desk. Um, the notion of the paper white background that really looks like a book actually matters because it's easier to read, because the lines are sharper. So, have, so we have now done our excursion into color. There's one last issue which would really only come up if you're doing fancy printing. That is, if you're doing fancy printing, and you have unit counters or map. Uh, the variations are called map and gloss. And this comes up if you're, say, painting a room in your house. That is, you have paint that is matte, fairly flat, and non-reflective. And you have paint that is highly reflective, and you have several shades in between. And the issue is that if you have something that is matte, a flat finish, like the paint in this room, which is fairly flat, you don't get glare spots where there are reflections. If you have gloss, the place where most people will see gloss, if you have window sills that have been painted enamel paint, 
Enamel is a high gloss paint, you get reflection. The reflection helps bring light into the room. However, if you are sitting here playing and the unit counters and maps are high gloss, they pick up all of the lights in the room, and because they are picking up all of the lights in the room, you get these little bright spots. It's like driving in traffic with the sun directly behind you. You get all of the glare reflections off the windows and chrome work, and it's unpleasant. Well, that's the practical. However, a lot of people think, ooh, gloss, cool, and don't realize they're making it hard on themselves. So to some extent, there is a consumer preference, and in this case, the consumer is always right, even though he is very clearly, in this case, completely wrong. Um, that sort of co covers matte and gloss. Um, there are a few other complicated issues in printing. Um, if you are doing large-scale printing, you are probably, you may very well be using not the RGB color scheme, red, green, blue, of a computer screen or of a computer printer. You may be seeing CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow. K stands for black somehow. And CMYK give you different colors. Now, there are computer printers, like a Xerox phaser, that will actually print the dots of color all at the same time, exactly where you want them. But if you have big presses, what is done is you do a pass with each color of ink, and the inks are superposed, and you somehow get all of the colors you want by superposition. Uh, the difficulty with that is something called registration, namely if you print the yellow and the red and the green, or blue rather, separately, and you print one X in each color, the X's may be drifted a bit with each other, and this has the result, it's, the printing has gotten much better than it was 50 years ago. The net result is you will get things shift in one color that are slightly shifted with respect to the other. Now this could be a very serious problem in game design. Here's a square, and it's going to be a mountain square. And the rule is if there's any mountain color in it, it's a mountain square. So we've printed the square with gray lines, and we now print the mountain. And if the mountain is brown lines sort of near the center, the fact the brown lines may be left or right doesn't matter. But if we do what is done in some games, which is to shade the whole area, so it's totally obvious this is a mountain square, you now have the serious problem that if the registration drifts, the color drifts into the next square, and you have a set of rules lawyers who will dutifully claim that this is a mountain square, because there's some brown in it. And so when you print, you leave edges, and you design the map recognizing limitations on the print process so that the map is readily readable. Uh, there are other neat ways to make unreadable maps. There is a notorious example in Avalon Hill 1914 where the rail lines are bright blood red and narrow. That's fine. Unfortunately, the mountain, the rough terrain, it's not really mountain, it's very hilly, it's like the Ardennes, is a very dark brown. And the rail lines tend to disappear into the mountains. Quite literally, it's hard to pick them out. A well-designed game, Stalingrad is much better designed in this respect. You, in general, will have absolutely no trouble picking out one type of terrain or another, because you can see them cleanly. So I have said a bit about color. Let's go back to the movement rules. So we say we have movement. Uh, and then there are things that affect movement, like weather. A Stalingrad, each turn in the Stalingrad represents a month of time. And as you crank through several years, you go through periods where the weather is perfect, and periods where the weather is mud, and periods where the weather is snow. And mud cuts the movement rate in half, as does snow. However, I haven't gotten to this yet, there is also rail movement, which is very fast, 
And snow cuts the rail movement in half also. Mud does not. And so we have different sorts of rules for different types of weather. Now, there is a famous example of a computer game in which the designer carefully put in the effects of weather, but there's no reference to it anywhere in the rules. Uh, it's fairly hard to pick out that it's raining, and therefore the players have the experience that every so often they can't hit targets at the same distance, and every so often they can't move very fast, and there's no rational explanation of what's going on. It's as though the uh, data storage for the movement rates and accu weapons accuracy slipped some bits, and then they come back. No, that was weather. We do, however, in Stalingrad, in addition to regular movement, we have what we would describe as strategic movement. The exact name of the Stalingrad is rail movement. And the notion of rail movement is, yeah, they're railroads, they move very fast, they keep going 24 hours a day, and therefore, um, since they keep, do all these neat things, you can move units faster by rail. And the um, Stalingrad has actual railroads, which you can see there, the ties, there's the track. And if you, I'm putting down some hexagons, you move a unit from, say, here, which is not on a railroad, to here, which is on a railroad. And once you move the unit onto the railroad, you get a rail bonus of 10 squares. That is, you can just jump the unit along the railroad for up to 10 squares. Now, there's some slight complications. The first complication is that you have to take the rail movement all at once. You can't move, say, five squares on the railroad, do some off-rail movement, normal movement, and then take more rail squares. You have to do it all at once. The other requirement is you actually have to follow the rail lines. And so if I am moving along here, I can't jump to here and keep doing rail movement. I have to move along the railroad and change rail line at junction. This is something you have to specify in the rules as to how the rule is played. You could also have written the rule that you move along rail squares from rail square to rail square, and therefore, while the railroad is doing this, I could do, start with the unit here and do this as my rail move, because it's just square with a railroad in it to square with a railroad unit in it. Either is a legitimate rule, but you have to specify what it is. In fact, if you look at SPI Korea, the original Korea, uh, there were road squares, and you move, could use road movement if you move from road square to road square. Yeah, they drew rail roads in, and they were pretty to look at, but they were somewhat chrome-like in the sense the exact places the roads were drawn as running didn't matter. You just moved from railroad square to railroad square to railroad square, or rather road to road to road. Terrain, however, does something else. I mentioned there, was, there were swamps and there were mountains, and these are collectively known as rough terrain. And so here we have, my swamp symbols are not the same as the ones in the game, but mine I can draw quickly. And so here is a plain terrain square, and here comes a unit, and it moves into a rough terrain square. You move into a rough terrain square that is rough terrain, you have to stop. Having moved in, you can move in future turns from rough terrain square to rough terrain square, but you do this at a rate of one square per turn. So you can move units through mountains, you can move units through swamps, but it's very slow. And if you imagine the Germans showing up at the one edge of the Pripyat marshes, 
that sort of center of the map um, near the border, and marching due east through the Pripyat marshes, a move that would take one or two moves if you stayed in clear terrain will take around a half dozen because you're marching through the swamp, and it's slow. However, there is an exception to the swamp rule. And the exception to the swamp rule arises if there is a railroad. Because a railroad and the bridges with it and the cleared terrain with it and other implications that there's been development where there's a railroad, uh, the railroad basically functions as a highway. So if I have a railroad, there's some squares. These are all mountain squares. However, I can move a unit onto the railroad, one square, and I can then march along the railroad using the normal movement rate. I could, of course, also use rail move, but I don't, might have a reason not to do so. And therefore, I can move along railroads using the normal movement rate. Question? Um, my question is, uh, you've been talking about the rail movement, and um, is there any, uh, do they account for the fact that there aren't, that there aren't, um, say, stations every, every tile? So, uh, places to board, or the... The answer is, we are doing freight movement, and no matter where you are, there are going to be, um, a certain number of places, uh, sidings where you can stop trains, or you can just stop trains in the middle of nowhere, and then you are organized to get on, move things onto the train or move off. Uh, remember, these are one-month trains, so if we say you're going to stop, you're going to get, have everyone get out of the cars, that's basically instantaneous on the game scale. There are games, 1914 is an example, where and training an army corps does not happen instantly. It takes a couple of days, and therefore, since 1914 game turns are a couple of days long, you move units onto the railroad and set them up on mm -hmm. one turn. On the next turn, you can use rail movement. Uh, on subsequent turns, you can either use more rail movement or you can get off again, but things actually take time. Um, and so you have choice. This is a design choice. The design choice in Stalingrad is that on the game scale, uh, there are no issues with getting on or off. Yes? Uh, do these games typically represent, like, the dangers of such terrain? Like, if you're going through a swamp, you have a greater chance of disease catching amongst your troops or whatever? Um, or you certainly could insert such things um, for the p area in question it's a non-issue. I mean, if you were going to uh, march a 19th century army through Central American swamps, there would be a major issue with yellow fever, which is why we were able to build the Panama Canal and several other people were not. Namely, we had a, a serious medical support. But um, in general, that's a level of chrome that does not... You could put it in, but... And in Stalingrad, it is not. Okay. There are no particular unique hazards. Yes? Um, earlier you said that swamps gave you half movement, but then later you said that they were rough terrain, so you had to end your um, turn. I think you misunderstood me if I said it was snow that's half movement. Oh, it was mud I was thinking of. I'm sorry, that's yes. why I... Mud is a type of weather. Swamps is a type of terrain. Mud affects all types of terrain, equally, except it doesn't accelerate you, so if you're in a swamp and it's muddy weather, you can still only move one square per turn. And so is weather on like a, a fixed schedule? On it's the answer, times, we'll get to the weather rules in a bit. The answer is that in Stalingrad, there are months that you're guaranteed good weather or snow, and there are a couple, there are four months where you must roll dice against the weather table, and you will be surprised as to whether there is good weather or mud or snow, and you do not know which it will be. Okay. Okay. The limitation, the movement rule limitation, 
is that you can cross one hex edge between two mountain squares that um, is not crossed by a railroad. And you must then move along the railroad. So I could, if this is a mountain square, I could move here to here and then march this way or this way. But if I move here to here, I then cannot move that way because the railroad does not cross this hex edge. And that's within one turn? That's in one turn. Okay. You can't do this in one turn. You can do this. Um, you could also do it the other way. If this is clear terrain, I could move here, and then I can march along the railroad because I've only crossed one hex edge into rough terrain. Now, there are other games with other rules. The point of doing Stalingrad, the point of doing a board, an exact board game or two, is so you see an example and another example, and now you have something to hang your thinking on when there are lots of different ways of doing the same things. As I said in the introduction, there are 6 and 90 ways to write tribal lays, and every single one of them is right. However, it's useful to take an example and so we can explain what meter is and rhyme is and assonance is. And after you've heard examples of this, it's much easier to explain. There are all of these different meters, and you can use any one of them, but you should realize they're all different. So in any event, there we have um, the core issue on how terrain affects movement. Oh, if it wasn't obvious, I did not say seas and lakes are impassable. You cannot move units onto them. But there is an amusing side effect. If you have snow, there is a line described in the rules, and north of that line, all of the lakes freeze and turn to ice. All of the swamps freeze and turn to clear terrain, meaning, well, yes, snow, you can only move at half rate, but you can charge straight through swamps. All of the rivers freeze, that affects combat, and this lasts until it thaws. And one of the objectives that a certain number of players have, because it's actually quite tricky to do, is to retreat enemy units onto the lake in such a way they are sitting on the lake when the lake thaws. This removes them from the board. Um, I know players who have been playing the game for years and years, playing it a lot. They have never pulled this off. It's really tricky to do. But it's a hypothetical rule, so after all, it's a condition that could arise. You have a unit which is in an illegal location, and the, if it's in an illegal location, what happens to it? It didn't move into the illegal location by making an illegal move. It found itself in the illegal location. What is the outcome? And this is something a good designer has to do. You have to anticipate how play will advance and create situations where you have to write specific rules. Well, any of that, I have discussed movement. I have run us out of time almost. Um, next time we will get to combat. And I would urge you, read ahead so you follow what I'm discussing. We're sort of plugging through the chapters one piece at a time. The Stalingrad combat scheme for strategic combat is extremely archetypical. It's the way lots of games do things. They're alternatives. Uh, for next time, um, I think it would be useful, if you can all manage it, to um, get set up on the Zun Tzu module at least some unit counters on the map. And one of the things you can do is to email me a copy of your map with unit counters showing. It doesn't have to be a legal position. It would be nice. But if you get them showing, so you show that I'm set up. And I will email each of you, I've got everyone's address, a sample game. Not a great game, but a game. Um, I may have to use the Vassal Stalingrad module, but I will send you a game. In any event, that is it for today. We are done. <laughs>